I began my investigation in the capital, Damascus, in September. Traveling with my producer, who speaks Arabic, we entered the country posing as tourists. Before my trip, I'd spent weeks arranging access to opposition leaders inside Syria. I'd been given a local cell number to call. After using a code word, I was told to go to a location where my underground contact would be waiting. The plan was to travel 10 miles from Damascus to the town of Douma into the midst of the uprising. My contact was a young businessman. Like other opposition activists, he uses an alias. His is Abu Khaled. Abu Khaled's meeting with another activist now to see if the roads are safe and they can get us in. Abu Khaled's also told us that at a funeral of a protester today, seven people were shot. He said protests were happening along the road to Douma, and he'd take me to see them. But there were army checkpoints everywhere. Abu Khaled used a network of lookouts to find the safest route. This happens every five, ten minutes or so. One of the cars guiding us in front will change, and another car will join us. The regime, Abu Khaled told me, feared the protests reaching downtown Damascus. The protest is considered Syria's president, Bashar al-Assad, a tyrant. Further along the road, we heard there was a funeral for a young protester who died in prison. We stopped to film. Abu Khaled said we had to be quick, as there were government informants everywhere. Outside the cemetery where 22 year old Ayman Zaklul had just been buried. After being shot in the leg at a protest, he was arrested by the security forces. A week later, Ayman's body was returned to his family. He had received no medical treatment and had been terribly tortured. One of his eyes had been gouged out. Abu Khaled said we needed to leave. He told me nearly every day in towns like these, security forces shoot and kill protesters. In the next town, 2,000 people had gathered to mourn the deaths of more protesters, including that of a 14-year-old boy. He'd been killed in nearby Douma. They are singing a song about I shed tears for those martyrs who were killed for the for the young and for the for the freedom of Syria. Protesters burned the Russian flag, angry at Russia for being one of the regime's closest allies. Abu Khaled thought we may have been spotted by informants. We had to leave immediately.
Finally, we arrived in Duma. I wanted to see where the 14-year-old boy had been shot. The 14-year-old boy was killed at a protest on Friday, and they're taking us to the spot where he was killed. Then, then. This, this is was blood. covered with blood. We had to use sand. Oh, God. You can, you can see the trail of blood. They said there was so much blood that they had to put sand on it to soak it up. And you can still see where the blood was. And here are the bullets. Bullet there. Bullet hole here, bullet hole here, bullet hole here. He poked his head round from this corner, and they say a sniper shot him in the head. The boy's father agreed to speak with me as long as I didn't identify his family. He told me his son had been excited about going to a protest. <laughs> ليش تأخرت مدري شو المهم لبس وطلع عمل لك والله مثل الصاروخ عمل لك بعد ثلاث أربعة ساعة يمكن بس يا أربعة وربع يمكن يا أربعة ونص كان علينا جارنا إجا قال لي تعال حاني عم نستشفى حمدا نستشفى دغري بعد A protester filmed the wounded boy being taken for help من قال لي برقبته ركضت أنا الثاني أكثر رحنا مع لحقنا وكانوا منزلين على العملية كان المساء صحي شوي الحمد لله صار تطلع فينا يوم التاسع المساء توفى كان نهار أحد الأسبوع هذا يعني يعني ما في شغلة جايبة هو أو أخذها إلا عملها عم بعد وتفكر فيه وفكر فيها يعني بش. عاد رحمة الله عليه Activists then took me to one of the hubs from where they organized the resistance movement. I met one of the leaders of the uprising who uses the alias Abu Hazem. He's known as a coordinator or in Arabic, Tansiriat. He showed me what had happened to his friend. His name was Mohammed Bashir al Shami. He'd been arrested just days before and interrogated for the names of fellow coordinators. Abu Hazem has been collecting evidence of atrocities in the area. He had buried DVDs of the violence in his garden. He hopes this evidence will one day be used to prosecute President Assad for war crimes. He wanted to show me video of an earlier incident that had provoked the revolt in Douma. هون كانوا بالجامع عم يصلوا عالشهداء اللي سقطوا يوم الجمعة في 22/4/2011. Hundreds had gathered outside the mosque to mourn the death of men killed at a protest. They were met with gunfire.
Yeah, so you, and we've just seen the funeral procession taking place. They're carrying two bodies, and the activists are pointing to the top of a building they say is the Department for Military Security. They say the shooting's coming from there, and there were snipers on top of this building. Abu Hazem keeps meticulous records of those killed, tortured and injured in Douma. Abu Hazem says that the man who owned the printing shop that was printing lists like this of dead protesters and printing banners that are held up by the protesters was killed by the authorities. Nobody is safe here. I'd been told we could meet three key activists on the run from the government. I was given instructions to go to the town of Madaya, 30 miles northwest of Damascus. The activists have told us there may be two military checkpoints on the way and that soldiers have been searching cars and confiscating all laptops and cameras. At each checkpoint, we were searched, but our camera wasn't discovered. When I reached Madaya, I was rushed to the safe house where the activists were hiding. Two hours later, the town was surrounded by the army. The activists were terrified. All of the activists who are with are wanted men. They've had word that the army is here looking for them. Like all the other activists I'd met, they used aliases for safety. Engineering graduate Abu Jaffa organizes demonstrations in Madaya, setting times, dates and locations. Syrians have established opposition groups in towns across the country. The men were members of one of the biggest groups, the Syrian Revolution General Commission. 22-year-old law student Malik said Syrians were no longer willing to tolerate the one-party state. President Assad belongs to the Alawite Muslim sect, a minority group in a mostly Sunni nation. But the men insisted the uprising wasn't about religion. It was about democracy. Malik explained how he became an activist. He'd been arrested by security forces at one of the first protests back in March. Malik's six weeks in prison led him to join the opposition movement full time. He and the other two men now move from safe house to safe house. Several times they'd only just escaped arrest. With Medaya surrounded, I had no option but to stay the night with them. It's really hard to sleep when you know that a soldier can break down your door any minute. And I'm constantly anxious and scared that we're going to be tracked down. And this is just a fraction of what these guys go through as wanted dissidents. They've been living like this for the past five months. For the next two days and nights, we were holed up in the safe house. Our food supplies started to run out. To get clean drinking water, Malik was forced to venture to a nearby spring. We all watched news coming in from Arabic satellite channels on the protests and erupting violence.
On the third morning, Abu Jafar tried to find out the latest news on the militia and army. It's the first internet login of the day and he's just checking in with all the other coordinators and activists around Syria to find out what the news is. Activists from outside the town had posted footage of the armed forces entering Madaya. So now you can see some white pickup trucks filled with it looks like armed men and he says that that's Syria's militia. These militia gangs, locally called Shabiha, are Assad loyalists. The opposition accuses them of terrorizing their neighborhoods. Three hours later, Abu Jafar received a call from a lookout. They confirmed the Shabiha were conducting violent house to house searches. The lookout warned they were kicking down doors on our street. Malik, Mohammed and Abu Jaffa all hid in the attic. They told me not to hide, but to have my passport ready to show that I wasn't Syrian. We hid our camera, but used a cell phone to film. I could hear the screams from next door as the militia raided the house. A mother was pleading with them not to take her son. After six hours, I could no longer hear movement outside. A lookout had just called Abu Jaffa. We waited 12 more hours before we got definite news the militia had left. The coast is clear outside the safe house. The soldiers are gone. They think that the army's retreating from the town, and so the guys are frantically packing everything up now. We'd been trapped in the safe house for 72 hours. As I left, I saw the smashed windows next door. The militia had sprayed slogans on the walls. There's graffiti everywhere on all the houses. The guys are pointing it out and it says, we love you, Bashar Assad, we love you, our president. Before I left Madaya, one of the activists took me to his family's home to see the aftermath of the raids. Dozens of people had been arrested in the town. The United Nations estimates more than 3,000 protesters have died. Thousands more have been badly injured. I was told it was no longer safe to take wounded protesters to public hospitals. 
Instead, secret hospitals have been set up in safe houses across the country. In a location on the outskirts of Damascus, I met an opposition doctor. He spends every night tending to the injured. The doctor says this man was shot three times. You can see this is a superficial wound here from where he was shot. The bullet's still embedded in his vertebrae. They haven't been able to take it out. The doctor told me government security forces raid hospitals in search of injured protesters. He was scared. Ten of his fellow doctors had been arrested. Despite this, he continued to help all those he could. To cope with the sheer number of casualties, Activists have established a medical supply chain spread across dozens of locations. We've just been brought to another building near the secret hospital, and this is where they store the medical supplies and the equipment. The activist in charge of coordinating the hospitals told me most of the medical supplies are smuggled in from Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. Here there's bandages. Over here there's box of drugs, medicine, surgical scrub solution, doctor's gown for operating. There's even a heart monitor, and all of this has been hidden away in this warehouse because they're so scared of being raided by the militia. I was taken to another secret hospital a man was treating his brother using improvised medical equipment. There's a man lying on his bed in a safe house, and he's looking very, very upset and bewildered. Mohammed is a 36-year-old father of three. His brother told us they'd been protesting together. Because of the delay, Mohammed's brain was starved of oxygen, causing brain damage. Nearby, in another secret location, I met a 19-year-old student shot in the leg while protesting days earlier. Do you feel safe here? <laughs> I travelled to the countryside to meet some soldiers who had defected from the army. About 70% of the Syrian army is made up of men who have been drafted. The opposition claims thousands of them are deserting. I met with four of the soldiers who are now on the run. He was stationed in Reef Damascus, the suburbs of Damascus. These two were stationed in Dera in the south, and he was stationed in Tartus, which is on the coast in the north. The men claimed they had deserted because they were forced to fire on protesters. What were your orders? 
يعني اكثر من 40 مزار تطلع العالم ويجبرونا انه نقوس، اذا ما قوسنا الامن والشبيحه بيقوسوا العساكر من وراهم، انا ما بعرف اذا قتلت حدا ولا لا بس اضطريت اني اقوس على المظاهره وفي كثير عدد كبير انه انه مات من الاطفال الابرياء ومن من الحريم يعني في كثير ناس ماتوا This man said he'd seen other soldiers killed for disobeying orders. نحن بنكون اول والامن والشبيحه من ورانا عصابات الاسد كون ورانا اذا ما قوسنا واطلقنا الرصاص على المتظاهرين بيقتلونا هن. ايه انا شفت بعيني يا رفيقي حدي ما قوس على المتظاهرين او قوسوه قوسوه براسه وقنصوه بالقناص حتى. These soldiers, whose stories can't be independently verified, claim many deserters are joining the revolution. بدنا نحارب النظام، إذا بصح لنا سلاح من من قتل النظام. نحن بنتمنى أن نتقلب مسلحة. Some deserters have formed a group called the Free Syrian Army. They claim to be at least 10,000 strong and warn without war, Assad will not fall. But they face security forces totaling more than 300,000. The UN says nearly 200 children have now been killed. I was taken to meet one child caught up in a protest. His father said his 15-year-old son was lucky to have survived. On his way to the shops, the boy had excitedly joined a demonstration. The security forces opened fire and he was shot in the head. The only way the boy can communicate is by raising his hand and blinking his eyes. Back in Madaya, where I'd been trapped in the safe house, it was now the scene of major protests. Despite dozens of arrests, whole families were out on the streets protesting. And they're all shouting, freedom, freedom. There are some banners there that say, Assad is a murderer. The opposition has been fueled with hope by Colonel Gaddafi's recent demise in Libya. Despite the killings and torture, the people I met insist they will continue their fight to overthrow the regime. Their struggle may yet be a long and bloody one. For more on this and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org. Frontline's Syria Undercover is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Frontline is also available for download on iTunes.